Phil, it looks like everyone's back from the breakout rooms. So I think okay. we can go ahead and uh, get started with the next section. OK. Um, all right. Um, I am going <clears> to <throat> share my screen. Oops. Oh, sorry. Before that, we have a question uh, from our room that uh, what's your suggestion on the video that people input into Mini? Like for us, if you're using Miniscope, it's like a thousand frame for, per each video. Does it matter if they input a, like, a concatenated video? Oh, good question. It actually matters. I think um, because um, you know, each worker have to kind of take a video and save that to a um, the kind of the the chunked array format. Um, I think each video has to be, you know, I just have to make sure each video can fit in two gigabyte of memory limit, I think, um, plus some sort of, yeah, I think, a thousand frame is sort of uh, it's around the max we can push uh, with the current limit. Um, so if your video is longer than that, maybe you have to increase the memory limit a little bit. But you know, only for the first step. It's it's just because each worker has to take that whole video and save it, and during that time, that whole video has to be holding memory, and that's the only concern. The other other than that, everything is fine. Because right after the first saving step, everything is kind of normalized. It's saved to the chunk array. And every operation is on those array. The video doesn't matter anymore. Uh, so thank you, Susie, for helping me ask that question. Actually, uh, I had another like related question. So basically what I want to do is to uh, stimulate the animal for like 30 times. So and each stimulation is like two minutes. So I only want these um, short chunk of data together. So that's why I thought it might be easier to concatenate. it. So what would you, uh, what's your suggestion on this um, um, type of experiments? So I mean, uh, I assume you mean concatenate. You mean across different session of stimulation, right? Like different yes. chunk of stimulation time. Uh, but you're still using miniscope recording, right? Which kind of automatic mm. chunk to a thousand frame for you. Uh, so when uh, so I haven't used it yet. So if okay. I use it, just start and then stop and then start and then stop. Then so yeah. output will automatically be concatenated together. Uh, with the miniscope software, I don't think so. I think the default is chunked into a thousand frames. So, but if I start and stop again, mm -hmm. uh, will these two sessions be? Um... No, I think they're even in a different folder. Oh, okay, okay. So what I need yeah. to do is just put them everything in one folder. In theory, and... yeah. There might be a little bit problem with some of the video that doesn't have a thousand frame in the end. Uh, we had to, in theory, it should work, but we had to maybe figure that part out. Because sometimes the, uh, the 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 library we're using doesn't really like different, like irregular size of chunks. Uh, so we'll see about that. But yeah, it should work uh, in theory. If you just put everything, all the video into one folder and name them accordingly in order. Okay, yeah, it should okay. work. We've tried that, it works, at least for like three different sessions combined together. Let's put them in the same folder. Okay, thank you. I didn't know that. Wow, thanks for sharing. <clears throat> okay, um, I guess I'll go ahead and share my screen. Um, okay. Um, well, okay, so welcome back, everyone. I hope uh, you all have a good break, I, I like a time to breathe. Um, so let's sort of uh, resume uh, just to catch everyone up. Uh, in the morning, we did setting up part. We did the pre-processing and motion correction. So, you know, at this point, we basically have a video that's free of noise and background uh, and motion. And we are basically ready to extract cells from it. But, you know, if you remember stuff from, from the talk hey, yesterday, Bill? yes. Yeah. Your screen right now is quite blurry. Maybe try um, unsharing and then resharing or something. Okay, I, I click the 
optimize for video check, maybe I shouldn't do that. Uh, but I also couldn't stop my sharing because can someone kick me and I can reshare. It looks good, good for me now. Okay, I'm gonna share again without changing anything. Uh, just like in the morning. <clears throat> Is it better now? Yeah, that looks good for me at least. If okay. anyone else it doesn't look good, let us know. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so as long as everyone can see the code, I guess it's fine. Like what's going on here. Um, okay, so we already have, basically we have the data kind of cleaned up, ready for us to extract. But if you remember uh, before I actually run the CMF, we need this another section of initialization, which basically give you an uh, initial guess uh, of the spatial location of, of the cells and the uh, temporal activity of cells. Uh, so that's what the initialization section is doing. Let us go ahead, go to this 5.1 uh, section. Uh, the very first thing we want to do is compute a max projection. There's not really much to explain about that. We just need it uh, for both for plotting and for something else. Uh, we're just gonna compute that and let it run. Uh, it should take you a few seconds like this. <clears throat> and then uh, we have the first step which is generating uh, an overcomplete set of seeds out of nowhere. Again, seeds are just kind of a single uh, pixel or like a, like, a, like a white spot, or if you could picture that. Um, it's basically a putative location of cells, and we're going to use those uh, to generate our initial spatial footprint. But you know, in order to get it out of nowhere, we need to run this generation step. Uh, let's go ahead and run the next two step because it might take a few seconds. Um, while it's running, uh, let's take a quick look at the parameters. Um, <clears throat> so again, the, the way we, we generate seed is basically we take local maxima on uh, max projection frames uh, of the video. But in order to capture all the activities, like, you know, sometimes uh, as two cells are too close to each other and and one cell fired, it kind of shadow the other one, and they're both kind of merged together. If you take a single max projection, they're gonna look like a single cell, and you're gonna have one seed on that, which is not good. Uh, so in order to avoid that, we take multiple max projection across time uh, and across different subset of frames in order to sort of separate them as much as possible and have a different seed for each potential cell. Uh, to make them really over complete. So the parameters are basically defining this process. You know, it's defining how we take the local maxima and defining how we take different subset of frames uh, to do this. So the default strategy of subsetting frames is the rolling. We basically take a rolling window and for each window, we compute one max projection and we do this uh, seed finding step. Um, the parameters to control that is basically the size of the rolling window and the size of the, the steps between windows. So you want to make sure that uh, the step size is at least uh, at most half of the window size. So your uh, your whole time, time frame uh, kind of uh, covered. Um, the alternative thing you can do is to randomly subsample uh, different uh, frames. Um, and you know there's a parameter to control for how many samples you want to take. But usually the rolling window is good enough. Uh, the other two parameters uh, define how we find the seed given a max projection frame. Uh, the max window is basically the, the window size for local maxima. Basically you take, uh, if you set it to 15 like here right now, you're basically taking the local maxima within a, a 15 by 15 window. And then the difference threshold is how much you uh, the, 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 the local maxima has to be different from the neighbors, right? Sometimes you, you can have like a random pixel that's just, that's one fluorescent value above all the neighbors. And that can be just randomly happening and that might be too noisy. You don't want that. Uh, so you want to threshold that a little bit. So most of these parameters, uh, works fairly well uh, across all the data. Um, the only thing you might want to change is the threshold for difference. You know, if you have a really good signal to noise ratio, if your cells are mostly really bright, 
you can increase that to reduce uh, the initial number of seeds. Uh, Sometimes uh, if you have a really long recording, uh, the number of seeds can be too much. And in those cases, you probably want to increase the window size a little bit to reduce the initial number of seeds. But in any case, here is what it should look like. And you don't want to be too kind of constrained on this. This is supposed to be an over complete set of seeds. You basically want to make sure for every single kind of potential cell you can see in this image, you want at least a white spot on it. You can have multiple, that's completely fine. Uh, but you want it to be overly complete and uh, you know something like looks like this. You, you see like this guy have like five, six seeds on, on there. That's completely fine. Uh, <clears throat> the only thing you need to caution against is if you, when you plot this, the whole whole screen kind of become white or like you have too many white along the border uh, of your image. Uh, that will really slow everything down and make it hard to clean up after. Uh, so as long as that doesn't happen and you have seeds on top of cells, you're good to go. Uh, so this is what it should usually look like when you run your own data. Okay, so <clears throat> uh, hopefully you are able to run through here and then we go into the peak noise, peak to noise ratio refine. Um, so um, again, if you remember the peak to noise ratio refine is based on the idea that a signal can be split into a low frequency component, and high frequency component. And we assume the calcium activity to be in the low frequency component. And we basically want that component to have a relatively larger amplitude uh, compared to the high frequency noise component. So uh, the most important parameter to choose in this step is the cutoff frequency to split up uh, these two uh, frequency components. And um, it's not only this parameter is not only used uh, for this step, but it's also critical to a lot of other steps, even down later in CMF. So basically uh, you want to use this visualization here once and determine on a single value of the noise frequency and use it consistently across all the steps. So let's go ahead and run the two cell under here uh, up to this blue box. Um, okay, so hopefully you get this visualization, same as me. Uh, so here we are basically, uh, <coughs> plotting uh, six randomly selected seeds um, from our initialized or complete set of seeds. And we, we, we're plotting their, basically the, the raw fluorescent uh, activity across time. Um, and we split them up into uh, the low frequency component, which is a red signal trace here, and the high frequency component, which is the blue noise uh, trace here. Uh, <clears throat> and you know we split them up based on different cutoff frequency. And we do them, you know, we, we sort of determine what's the best uh, frequency by looking at the, this plot. So as you can see here, um, let's say, let's see this guy. That, this is clearly a calcium event, I would say, right? It, it has this kind of rise and has a decay. Um, and that's in a red signal, of course, that's, that's what we want. But you also see that kind of correlated with this red peak, you have uh, some bigger fluctuation in the noise in the high frequency component, which means you know some some amount of signal is left in the in the high frequency uh, component, and that's not really what you want. So let's see, you know, if we start to increase the cutoff frequency a little bit, uh, we see more and more activity getting absorbed into the right trace. Uh, and you know, some somewhere here, uh, you I say you have a relatively good balance between uh, a clean red signal trace. You know, like it's, the red signal trace is really free of any noise, but also the the amount of residual fluctuation in the blue trace is sort of minimized. Uh, 
uh, as contrary, if you know, if you just keep going higher and higher, uh, you see that uh, the blue trace really becomes kind of clean as well. But the drawback of that is uh, you start to see this kind of high frequency uh, noise kind of bleeding into the signal line as well. And this will basically give you an estimation of zero noise for this, which is not accurate at all. So again, the idea is that you probably want to uh, look at this plot and choose something in between. I think usually uh, this value, you know, it's kind of like a good compromise between uh, between what's in the red trace and what's left in the blue trace. So, you know, I'm going to say 0.06 is good enough. Uh, and I'm going to sort of note down this number in my mind uh, and use this consistently across the rest of the pipeline. Uh, I'm going to say this is a perfect cutoff frequency for my uh, high frequency like uh, noise and signal trace. So with that, I'm going to kind of print out the parameter for peak to noise refine. Uh, as you can imagine, there are two parameters for this. The noise frequency we just talked about. The default is 0.06. We're not going to change that for today because it's, you know, we just look at it and it's pretty good. Uh, the other one is uh, the threshold of this peak to noise ratio. One basically means that your uh, signal amplitude has to be larger than your noise uh, uh, amplitude. Uh, if you set it to something like 1.5 or 2, it means that your signal uh, range or like a fluctuation has to be 1.5 or two times larger than the noise fluctuation. So uh, this default usually works for uh, for most, most cases, but it can change. Uh, uh, based on how much basic, basic, based on how much signal to noise ratio you have in your video. So I'm just gonna go ahead and run this uh, and look at the result. Um, should have run it earlier. Oh, thankfully, it's not too long. OK, we have a plot that's basically uh, all white here. But if you look closer, there are a few red spots. So how this plot is supposed to look like is that you have some white spot and you have a red spot. And the red spot basically means those seeds didn't pass the, the, the refine step. It means those seeds will be discarded. Uh, but as you can see here, basically this step is, is not doing anything. It's it's it, it dropped like three seeds. That's that's not good enough. Uh, because if you know if I go in here and I look at these guys, I, I don't I don't really know what they are. Like they may be real cells, but the signal to noise ratio of them is too low, and I don't really want to deal with them. Um, and I do want this peak to noise ratio refine. To, to drop them for me. So this can happen. Uh, it, it happens in this case because you know we really have a, we really kind of cherry pick a good video that has a really good signal to noise ratio. So you know, almost all the cells have a really great signal to noise ratio, even all these kind of really dark guys out here. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead in this case, I'm gonna go ahead and increase this threshold so that we, we are kind of more uh, strict on, on what we are calling cells. So uh, go ahead and, and do this uh, with me. We are going to change the parameter threshold. I'm going to change it to two. And then let's run the step again and see how it's going to look like. Um, any questions so far while we're waiting for like 20 seconds? Uh, also, we are sure people can unmute themselves, right? Okay. 
Okay. Um, okay, so after we change the threshold to two, well, we get something as something more as we expected. Um, we see a lot more red spot in here, which means this seeds will be dropped because it didn't pass the the peak to noise ratio uh, test. Um, and you know they are they are reasonable to me. Like all these red are on this kind of surrounding part of the field of view, and they, you know if you this is a max projection of the movie, and they are just really dim. And even though they're real cells, I don't know how much I want to deal with them. Um, so overall, this looks pretty good to me. Uh, you have this kind of uh, red spot also in between cells, clearly. Uh, that's kind of, they'll also be dropped, which is great. That's exactly what we want. Um, so yeah, I will say when you run your own data, you kind of visually aim for something like this. Uh, this is relatively uh, what, you, or what you expect the PNR refine to, to drop cells for you. Um, okay, I see a question here. So I'm curious because uh, if I remember, there is the opportunity to actually put uh, so an auto an automatic uh, peak to noise ratio value. So what is the best approach? So either we, we do this manually or so what is the automatic way actually doing? Uh, setting a threshold, you mean? So I remember that, I mean, there is the possibility to set the threshold with the real number or to set it as auto. Am I right? Yes, I, I took it out. Yes, you're right. Um, that function is still there. You can definitely still use that uh, approach. Uh, I took it out. Um, uh, the uh, uh, that step. Uh, because usually, no, you know, when we do it, uh, like it's it's much better. Like we have much better control, like by simply setting a number to it. Uh, and again, usually one works pretty great. Uh, it's in this particular case that we want to increase it a little bit. Um, so yeah, I'll say this step shouldn't take you too much iteration to get it right. You know, usually like from one to from the range of one to two, you should get a pretty good number, uh, and and also this step doesn't have to be perfect, right? You're just uh, basically taking out seeds so that the downstream step can be like faster. So you don't have to merge, you know, all, all kind of crazy seeds. So uh, it's not that critical to choose the, the, the optimal threshold per se. Uh, and it's usually, you know, usually one works. And, and if it doesn't work, try 1.5 or 2 and one of them should work. Okay, um, so but we, yeah. we can still run the auto and then see what the auto is actually giving out as an output. Uh, you mean you're running that or? So I'm wondering because I usually do the things that you're doing now. So just inspecting and playing yeah. with it. Yeah. So, but remember that there is also this option to put the auto. So yeah. is it possible to actually put the auto, check which value the auto will actually produce? So that we have a sort of a benchmark. Uh, yeah, I took those codes completely out. Uh, yeah, I was actually surprised by that. So I was wondering why. Yeah, because we don't usually use it. We just usually do it manually. And we find that's basically a better approach because you know you just have more control. Uh, the auto is not, I mean, if the auto is doing something crazy, you had to fix it manually anyway. Um, so that's why we, we, we are going with this approach. OK. Yeah. And, um, so maybe a naive question about why so some, there is some cells, some seeds have that uh, greenish uh, aura around it? Oh, because I'm plotting everything. Oh, let me see. Yeah. Because I'm plotting everything on a max projection of the, of the video. So oh, this okay. so is, you have the, the background is a nice on top of you have the seed. Okay, yes, exactly. Yes, yeah, so that's that's how you sort of tell which seeds are good or bad, right? Because you can sort of see whether something looks like a cell. So how did you do that? You just clicked on the legend, so to take. Oh it yeah, up. yeah. This is a little interactive feature of of this plotting. Cool, but so in some cases it seems that there is actually a, a cell under the red one. 
but that has been discarded because the signal to noise ratio was not good enough. Uh, I don't currently see any example. Like uh, in the bottom uh, right? Yes, there. Here? I mean, no, a bit more to the center now. Here? In the center down, I don't know how to tell you. I don't see that. Uh, it. So it's 150 by eight and I don't see it down, but. Oh. So yes, if you go to Zoom, you can annotate if you want. No? I think Zoom has an option to annotate if you want, but you can also tell me the number. No, I mean, if I see like 158 and uh, 300 width, it seems that there are a few cells. 158. And 300 width. There are like two cells that seems to be real, but then it's probably being discarded because they were on a lower field of view, and so the signal to noise ratio is not good enough. Uh, can you, can anyone see that? Can anyone help me annotate? I, I'm having a hard time finding it. My oh. cells? Yes. Uh, I mean, I guess it's kind of arbitrary. I, I don't really know what, whether they are real cells or not. If you believe they are real cells, you could certainly lower the threshold. We just see one will yeah. keep them. Yeah. So, and at the same time, you don't. So, if we see white dots on top of nothing, that is obviously a problem. Exactly. Yeah. So, at, at any step, you you want to be more kind of liberal on this, like okay. especially what, if you you care about capturing every cell. Cool. And what about the number of seeds? So does that tell us anything? If we see that there are cells with a lot of seeds on top while some other, they just have one. So what is telling me? Oh, that actually means the, um, you know, these cells are probably very active, you know, because these seeds are generated by, t by doing this on the max projection of subset of frames, right? Different subset of frames, right? So if okay. you see a, a bunch of seeds on the same cell, that, that basically means this cell was kind of active in all kind of chunks uh, of the of subset of frames. So every time it was active, there was a local maximum computed and it's get recognized as a seed. And because we're taking the union of all of them, it kind of get recognized multiple times. So yeah, that's that's okay, expect, cool. that's completely expected. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Um, so if that sounds good, um, let's go ahead and do a, a merge step. Um, so uh, let's go ahead and run this while we talk about the parameters. So there are three parameters for, for, for merging the seeds. Uh, two, uh, I guess, one of them is about space. The other is about uh, time. Well, as you can imagine, the, the idea of merging is basically to kind of threshold uh, the spatial distance between the seeds, as well as the temporal correlation of the seeds. So that's kind of the two source of information we're going to use for merging. Uh, for the distance, you know, we have a single parameter to define. Uh, five is in the pixel unit. I do want to reiterate again that every single parameter uh, here is relative to the to the downsample data. It's, it's relative to the underlying data. So if you downsample by two and you set this to five, it actually means kind of like 10 in the original full size of movie. So just be aware of that. And you know, don't don't be surprised if uh, the parameter change uh, based on whether you're down sample or not. Um, <clears throat> so five, that's the pixel unit. Uh, that defines that basically says okay, any seeds that's within five pixels of each other can potentially be merged. Uh, it do has to pass another threshold, temporal threshold, uh, point eight uh, of Pearson correlation between the seeds. So basically, if a seed is um, within five pixels of each other and has a, uh, has a temporal correlation greater than 0.8, they're going to be merged. Um, <clears throat> the only other thing, uh, the, the only other parameter is again a noise frequency. 
is used here because when we compute the uh, temporal correlation, we want to uh, avoid account, taking account of the noise correlation as much as possible. So actually before computing the correlation, we actually smooth the traces and the noise frequency define uh, how much, you know, what's the cutoff frequency for the smoothing. Um, so that's the three parameter we have. Um, and I, I believe we are ready to see the result. So the visualization is the same idea as before, although we are not really, it's sort of weird because we are not really dropping anything, but on the other hand, we are dropping seeds because uh, if a seed is being merged, uh, they'll be gone for downstream analysis, right? They are, you know, we'll only keep one seed uh, if a group of them are being merged. So that's sort of how, how you interpret this plot and expect it to work. So you should be able to see that, uh, let me pick maybe a good example here. For some cell here that has multiple seeds, you kind of want like most of them to be red because that means those seeds will be sort of merged and they, they're considered merged and they'll be discarded for later. And you want to make sure there's at least one uh, white spot left for each cell. So that's what kind of what you're seeing here. So this guy, you know, all these are kind of dropped and merged. Uh, they're probably merged to this white guy. Uh, we, you know, nothing is pretty perfect. So you do see that this is probably a single cell, but it has three white spots left. Uh, that's completely okay. You don't have to get it perfect at this step. Uh, the main goal of this step is to sort of give an initial path of merging and sort of reduce the computational demand later because, you know, it can be, become heavy later. Um, <clears throat> so you want, you know, to try to get, it, uh, get them to merge as much as possible by tweaking the two threshold uh, we just talked about. Uh, but again, if you see multiple white spot on a single cell, it's completely fine. Uh, I guess what you do want to avoid is that uh, you don't want to over merge stuff. Like you don't want uh, two cells to be kind of merged together into one cell and CMF will really have a hard time uh, dealing with that. I cannot even, by definition, CMF cannot separate cell for you. So, um, you know, we can always merge more later, but it's really hard to separate cells later. It's actually impossible to separate cells later. So uh, that's the kind of the mindset you should get, uh, uh, you should have uh, when looking at this plot. Again, you sort of want uh, the seeds on a single cell to be kind of merged and mostly red, but you want to make sure you have at least one white spot for every single cell and it's fine to have multiple. Um, so yeah, here is kind of uh, like visually the feeling of how it should look like on your own data. Um, and um, yeah, this is basically the merge step. Um, <clears throat> And after this, we are gonna do initialize. Okay, I see a question. Um, let me go ahead and run this too, because I know one of them is gonna take long. And so run the two cell under 5.5 spatial matrix and then I'm ready for answer, uh, for questions. Awesome. Uh, I think it's a quick one. So here, yeah. If you get the initialization wrong, right? Like yes. it's, say you have too many white dots and, and empty spaces, or you know you killed some cells. Uh, does this have? Does it just make the CNMF go longer until convergence, or do you actually end up with like a crappier reconstruction at the end? Um, so I guess it kind of depends on. Uh, what exactly happens when you say you get the initialization wrong, right? Mm -hmm. So they, they can happen multiple ways. So I guess uh, over merging is one thing, you know, I mentioned I see commonly happens. Uh, that would be kind of sort of catastrophic because again, CM cannot separate cells for you. You're just going to have wrong estimation. Like you're going to have cell kind of, that's 
two cells have, have a single spatial footprint, which would be wrong, right? Um, too many seeds should be fine. Uh, they will make every step slower, of course, later, uh, especially when you, when you go too crazy and have a lot of uh, seeds. Um, but in theory, you know, if you can, in theory, you can kind of recover that by doing more, more merging and potentially more iteration of CMF later. Uh, so it's kind of depends. So within reason, that's okay. Uh, if you have really too many seeds, uh, it will just you know take you insanely long time to do everything. Um, uh, well, I think I'm not the, sure whether that's, uh, yeah, go ahead. The, the other thing is if you have seeds that are kind of on the background or if you have any sort of fluctuating background noise, if your videos have poor signal to noise, like I often do with, um, with amygdala imaging or deep brain imaging, uh, that if you have too many seeds, you're more likely to get things uh, that are not cells included and they aren't always dropped um, at subsequent steps. And so it can be a bit more of a pain in the ass. So I, I, I mean, like Phil says, it's within reason, they'll be dropped, but I, there's definitely a downside um, and the potential for a lot of sort of false positives if you have too many seeds. Gotcha. Awesome. Thanks, y'all. Phil, just one fast question. So, I mean, this is a really optimal uh, situation where the sparseness is great. The signal to noise to ratio is uh, fine. Mm -hmm. So, so the threshold that would be used to to actually change, I mean, has to be changed based on your signal to noise ratio, as you say, from one to two. While so the threshold oh, it's right, right? Yes, the signal one. Noise. Okay. So while now this is, I mean, this is actually the time to to change your threshold distance based on your sparseness, correct? Oh, this. Okay, yes. Okay, so cool, and and it is in pixels. So what I mean, what is the procedure? You actually go, you look more or less, and has some cells, and then uh, I mean, you look with the eye. There is nothing like. Uh, sort of, uh, I don't know, uh, average distance between the seeds to make you decide or something like that? Because you, you don't have this centroid at these points. Uh, I don't have it. Sorry, I think I missed your last sentence. So no, what I'm saying is that uh, so to understand the threshold distance, uh -huh. I mean, usually you can get the size of the cell by just looking at your average cell. Right. So to get the, your... Uh, Average threshold distance. Uh, what are you going to do to actually? I don't know. Oh. Zoom to the image. And, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, I mean, I mean, of course, you can just just throwing a number, run it, and look at it, right? But uh, yes, yeah, so it's kind of depending. It's it's a mix. It depends both on the density of the seed you have, mm -hmm. and of course the density of yourself. So I guess you know if you can sort of you know mentally. <laughs> Kind of picture everything to be white here. Actually, hold on. Let's do this. So I guess uh, the other kind of beneficial thing to do is that before you do the merge, uh, you want to get the seed to look like this in the sense that they are sort of clustered together on a cell, right? So yeah. you don't want to too many, for example, you don't want many seeds here, right here, so that they can sort of connect the two sides. You want them to be sort of isolated and clustered within each other. And then your threshold distance will probably be, you know, the average distance or like the, the maximum distance within a cluster, uh, but, you know, smaller than the distance uh, across uh, the space. So, uh, so well, what happens in the worst case scenario where you actually have uh overlapping uh, cells. So usually you need the temporal trace to actually differentiate uh, them. But in this case, you will see the seeds. On, so you can see a cluster of seeds that is actually referring uh, to, to two cells, one on top of the other. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, I mean, yeah, the, I mean, there's the temporal threshold to sort of guard against that. 
I, I would say, you know, if they're really on top of each other, that's going to be really hard to determine, especially by eye. Uh, but yeah, uh, you, I guess you have to kind of handle that specially in that case. Uh, and maybe it's even hard for a human to say whether they're same cell or not, if they are really on top of each other. Uh, mm -hmm. But usually you should see, you know, maybe the shape will become elongated or the shape looks like they are kind of different cells. Yeah, like there is one there probably at uh, 278 and uh, 400 width uh, seems one of those cases. Yeah, this one? No, actually at 278. This two? Yes. Yeah. OK, so at this point, I mean, the seeds will not offer you any idea, but I mean, you will be able to separate them, uh, hopefully, so that they are not active at the same time by considering the temporal trace. Yes. OK, so yeah. but in this case, wait, OK, because in this case, the algorithm will actually put them together if they are very near each other. Uh, the, are you are talking about the merging? Yes. Uh, what well, they do have to pass both threshold. Like they have to be close to each other and have a high correlation. Okay, cool, cool, cool. Yes, and so it is high correlation. Okay, correlation, okay, is great. It's at 0 0.8 and, and I understand it. Mm -hmm. uh, so can you please tell me again what, why the noise frequency at this point? Uh, it's because when we calculate correlation, we want to smooth the trace first. Okay. We don't want the high frequency component to contribute too much to our correlation calculation. So that's why I think okay, so. cool, cool, yeah. cool. OK, thank you. Yeah. But you know, this, you just keep it consistent. Great. Yeah. Uh, oops. OK, so with that, you know, hopefully everyone is happy with our selection of seeds. Uh, and we already run through this part. Uh, I'm going to adopt the same strategy, which is just run ahead and talk uh, earlier. So go ahead and run 5.6 and 5.7. Those two steps are literally parameter free. So just go ahead and run them. And then we sort of scroll back a little bit on 5.5, uh, the initialization of spatial matrix. So. Um, the, there are again three um, parameter you can see here, and they are, uh, you know, noise frequency. I'm going to start with that because that's easy. Uh, you just keep it consistent. Uh, but the reason we use that is again, we want to smooth uh, the trace before computer correlation. So uh, the goal. Uh, I should remind everyone the goal of initialization of spatial matrix is that you know we have all these seeds now, but we cannot feed a single like pixel coordinates to CMF. That does that wouldn't make sense to the algorithm. The algorithm needs an initial guess of the shape and the, basically the spatial footprint of each cell. And in order to get a crude guess of that, uh, we take a simple approach. We for each seed, we're gonna calculate the correlation of uh, the temporal correlation of that seed to its neighboring pixels. And we're just going to use the correlation value themselves as uh, an initial uh, spatial footprint. Because you know, in the end, the spatial footprint is sort of like a, like a weighting matrix for each cell uh, on, the, on the field of view. So um, that's what we're doing uh, during the initialization of a spatial matrix. Uh, and that's also why we are calculating the correlation and that why we are uh, we need to smooth the trace before calculating correlation because again we don't want the uh, high frequency noise to play uh, too much a part in this. Um, <clears throat> the threshold here is not really, uh, uh, I mean, it is a threshold, but you know, um, it's not that critical to get it right. It is basically. Um, for for each of the the spatial footprint, uh, like if if the uh, if the correlation to the neighboring pixel falls below this threshold, we're just gonna set that to zero, right? So basically, uh, for our initial spatial footprint, uh, they they 
the source of them are the correlation values, but we don't want like low correlation value, like like 0.4 correlation. Is that still part of the spatial footprint? We don't know. We don't know, we don't want to say. So that's why we sort of threshold them. So basically, any correlation value be, below 0.6 will be artificially set as to zero, so that it's more like a spatial footprint rather than you know a pure uh, calculation of correlation. Um, so that's why we want to threshold that. Uh, the window size is purely for computational uh, reason. Uh, you don't usually need to change that. Uh, it is um, the the kind of the amount of neighboring pixels we're gonna do the correlation calculation. So apparently, you don't care. Like you don't want to calculate uh, the correlation between this seed and that pixel there. That makes no sense. There's no way a cell has a spatial footprint layer. Uh, so, and that's gonna take forever if you do all the pairwise calculation of this full kind of, uh, you know, 608 uh, field of view. Um, so that's why we have a, like a window size parameter. So basically this kind of limit the maximum possible size of your spatial footprint. Uh, it's, it's usually set liberally, like 15 is probably the maximum size uh, your cells gonna be, especially in this movie uh, that's already downsampled. Um, and you know, the the only, again the only reason we have this is for to reduce computational demand. Uh, so you can go slightly liberally, like make it large. But again, you don't want to make it too crazy, like 100. Uh, that's gonna just make everything slow for no reason. Um, so that's that. Again. Uh, most of this, you don't really need to tweak that much. Uh, you don't need to get them to be perfect, um, uh, except for the noise frequency, which has to be consistent, of course. And then the initialization of temporal and background terms are parameter free. Uh, for the temporal, I'm going to quickly tell you what happens. You, you, we basically use the spatial footprint as weight and calculate a weighted average of the temporal traces. I use that as a temporal matrix for each cell. The background, we basically subtract the cellular activity from the movie and we kind of take a mean frame, that's our spatial uh, background B, and take a mean fluorescence, that's our uh, initial estimation of the background F. Uh, there, you know, because we already removed background in our pre-processing, these two terms are kind of really estimate uh, crudely and simply and um, so as opposed to more you know, convoluted background model. Uh, after all of this, we can go ahead and run the initialization, which basically will plot the four terms we are uh, generating. And that's what CMF need uh, to carry out its algorithm. So here's a look of it. Um, we have the initial spatial footprint here. Um, as you can see, you know, there, they usually look quite flat because you know within these regions, uh, they are uh, the correlation value are usually pretty high, and they are they are not really different from each other. So basically, uh, what determines this kind of boundary is the uh, is the threshold we set, the 0.6. So, but again, you don't have to get this perfect. They don't have to like look exactly like the shape of your cell. Uh, you know, as long as they look reasonable, like like this, like they don't span the whole field of view, uh, it's uh, probably fine. Uh, same goes for the temporal activity. You know, as, long as you see some sort of calcium-like fluctuation here, you have some sort of confidence that things are working properly. Uh, the background term is sort of, you know, we, 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 are, we, we, we don't usually pay too much attention to them. The only thing I would say is that uh, make sure um, you know, the, because the background is basically you subtract cellular activity from the raw movie and take them in. Uh, you, you sometimes you see, you know, a lot of cells still being here, but they're not really because, you know, they are kind of, you can see kind of this dark hole on top of them, which means the spatial footprint, you have a corresponding spatial footprint on there. So as long as you can see, uh, the spatial footprint is covering every single cell here, uh, this is fine. Uh, same goes for the temporal activity of the background. As long as you don't see, you know, like a clear cell, like calcium activity, it's fine. So you can see this trace here is 
the most fluctuation is kind of the high frequency noise. Uh, there may be one or two kind of calcium like event, but they are kind of buried in the in the noise. So as long as it looks like this, it's fine. Um, so that's sort of the end of initialization. Uh, I guess there were a lot of talking, me talking, not really much interactive. Um, with these four terms, we are ready for CMF and uh, happy to answer any question now. Um, if no question, we can uh, go into a breakout room and, uh, uh, and you know, resume uh, later. I realize we are sort of slow on time. Um, does anyone have any question? Okay. Um, oops. Uh, is there anyone that's not able to follow along? Uh, I can't really see anything. Are people going to breakout rooms already or? I think everyone's still here. Oh. Everyone's still here? Okay. Okay, if everyone's still here, uh, because we are running slow on time, we are, we are running late. Is there anyone that needs a breakout to catch up? Or do everyone get basically this, the same as me? If you need a breakout, please say so immediately right now. Because otherwise, I'm thinking maybe we can skip the break for this part. Um, OK, I'm going to give it to. I'm gonna wait a minute, give you to 2.45. Uh, um, feel to respond if you need question. a breakout. If, okay. If you're not gonna to go to a breakout room. Yes. Uh, back, at the, back at the window one in the very beginning, 5.1, mm -hmm. uh, you were saying something about the window size. Because for me, I do have a long recording mm -hmm. and I have way too many YC, like my whole screen is low YC. Yeah. And which parameter did you say I should change for that? Okay, so I would say, you know, try to change this first. Uh, if you if you have seeds on the border, like if you have seeds somewhere where you know there should not be sound and you know it should have very low fluctuation, uh, I would try to change this first, the difference uh, increase threshold. It. Increase it because, you know, this dictates, you know, how much fluctuation there has to be for you to be considered a, a local max. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I would try to change that first, but if that doesn't work, or if you couldn't find a value, because you know if you keep increasing that, you're gonna drop cells. Uh, so there may or may not be a, a good value for this. Uh, in case you couldn't find it, uh, you can increase the window size, probably also the step size, so that you have less, you know, kind of this subset of frames, uh, these chunks, and that will in general reduce the number of seeds you get. Right, so the window size, how, what kind of increments should I be doing? Uh, 1,500, like 500 each? Yeah, something uh, along the same scale, yeah. Sure. Maybe double it. Uh, or double. Yeah. Okay. And then after, if the window size still is not ideal, then I, next next step I should do uh, I would say, like, as long as you, if you keep increasing window size, at some point it will be good. Okay, so just keep increasing. Yeah. So just leave the step size at 500. Uh, no, no, no. The step size and window size kind of go uh, side by side, right? Like, oh, okay, gotcha. The, right, the step size should be half. It's a hub. Step. Yeah, yeah. Okay, gotcha. Yeah, I have a person in my room with the same uh, issue. Like, uh, she has a lot of initialization of Cs, and we just increase the window size together with the step size a lot, <laughs> and it help reduce the... Is there any, like, bad things going to happen if you increase the window size a lot? Well, in theory, if you do it too much, uh, the the kind of the, the overshadowing thing we are trying to avoid in theory could happen, right? Because if you mm -hmm. have a huge window, I'll take the max projection, 
and two cells that's too close to each other both fired in that window. And somehow, you know, the local max could not pick yeah. up, uh, they can only pick up one of them. Uh, yeah. You can, can run into issue like that. Um, but usually it's, you know, relatively fine. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, we just increase it to like 8,000, the window that's, size. And that's on the large side, yeah. Yeah, and for, but I mean, as long as it looks fine in the visualization, it's good, yeah. right? Yeah. Okay. Okay, it's 47 now, I think. I'm go ahead and skip the break. Uh, unless anyone oppose. Okay, CMF part. Uh, 6.1, let's go ahead and run these two line. Uh, it's a boring line that's sort of parameter free. Um, the only thing you need to notice is that this is a, a, again a parameter about noise. Uh, you should keep this number consistent. This is 0.06, the noise frequency we determine on. Uh, the, the other number is 0.5. You, you can basically leave it at 0.5 all the time. It's kind of the, the maximum uh, frequency you can get. Um, so go ahead and run this too. Uh, they, it's, uh, you need this basically to, to calculate, to estimate a noise level for each pixel. Uh, and the spatial update is going to use that, um, you know, because you can reuse this variable, we, we sort of have an independent section for it to be calculated. Um, but anyway, just go ahead and run it. And then we are in the first spatial update. Um, let's go ahead and run one cell here. And again, uh, here is going to be the, the visualization. Um, for the sparse penalty parameter. And again, I want to show you how do you change the values you want to explore, right? What if you want to go finer or go larger in the range? Um, so, you know, I, I, I sort of expose these long lines of code uh, out here because I want to give you flexibility to change stuff. Uh, so hopefully, you know, uh, I assume everyone's relatively familiar with Python code. You can sort of read this, uh, read the logic of this. Basically, we define a sparsity list like this. And we, we define some dictionary to hold the result. And we go into a for loop, run the update spatial function on different parameters. And then we kind of save the result into the dictionary. And we uh, run this visualization line to, to, to kind of uh, put together a, a plot or visualization for us. Um, the reason I'm sort of going over this with you is that, uh, you know, I want to let you know that it's fairly easy to add another parameter to explore if you really want. Uh, I'm not going to demo that right now because it can be convoluted. But, you know, the idea is that you, add, you, you put in another list, some, some list, uh, and you kind of go over them. You go over them in the for loop. You run the update spatial with, with different combination of values in these two lists. And you you know save the result and you do the same. So I'm going to delete that for now. But I do want to show you how to you know add in two values uh, in this uh, sparse penalty parameter list. So for fun, I'm going to add in a zero, which by definition will be like no punishment on sparse penalty. Uh, so go ahead and add a zero on the left under this list uh, of this list, and then. I'm going to go like 0.1 here to give you a more extreme case of uh, what happens when the sparse penalty is really high. So go ahead and add this two and run the following two line. Um, you're going to see a lot of printout. It's quite verbose uh, because you know each time you run the spatial update, uh, kind of have this uh, printout for you. Okay, so hopefully you are seeing something similar. Okay, again, but uh, by the way, I forgot to mention this. Um, because these 10 cells are randomly selected, 
you probably not uh, this very minimal chance you're gonna see the exact same tin cell as I'm seeing, but the the general idea should be the same. So, um, you you know you're gonna you should have ten uh, the spatial footprint of ten cells in this plot, and their corresponding binary uh, spatial footprint up here. I should have ten traces that kind of looks like real uh, cellular activities. So let's go ahead and take a closer look at, at some of them. Um, you see that when, when we have sparse penalty of zero, like we basically are not punishing uh, for the sparsity of anything, you see that the, the, the spatial footprint are sort of reasonable, like it kind of capture the, uh, the, the shape of cells. But if you look at the, the binary version of that, you see the binary version is much larger than what you can you know, appreciate from, from this spatial footprint. That means there are a bunch of little, like tiny values, like insignificant values around here, but they're non-zero. So this is a good sign uh, for you to know that the sparse penalty might be too low. And we know it's too low, of course, because I set it to zero. But um, basically when you, this is what's happening, like when you have a sparse penalty that's too low, you, you're gonna you know, end up with cells that kind of uh, have a spatial footprint that expand into neighboring pixels. That's not really part of it. Um, and a, a quick way you can know this is that the binary version of the spatial footprint is much, you know, is visually much larger than the than the pseudo colored version. And that's how you know you the sparse penalty is a little bit low. You see that when we increase, this is getting better. Uh, if we increase further. Uh, you see that uh, over and over, uh, oops, I go too much. You see that here, it's probably okay because you know the, the binary version of spatial footprint are, are relatively constrained uh, to, the, you know, to the actual shape of cell, if you will. Uh, and you know, somewhere, something like this is usually a good enough choice of sparse penalty. Uh, I sort of kind of spoiled the fun for you, if you go higher uh, than sparse penalty, you see basically some cells are being dropped. Uh, if you if you set sparse penalty, that's too high. You see, we used to have the 10 cells, now we only have like five. And if you go even higher, you know, you have even less cells and, and the spatial footprint are becoming artificially tiny. Uh, if you remember, they, they were, they used to be much larger, but now they're like, like three by three pixel size. Um, so you definitely don't want that. Uh, one rule of thumb is that you don't want the spatial uh, update to really drop any cell for you per se, because you know it's it's just updating the shape of the spatial footprint. It doesn't do the autoregressive modeling on CMAP. So you generally don't want this step to drop cells for you. Uh, so which means you definitely don't want uh, any sparse penalty that's on this side. So I'm gonna say, go ahead and say 0.01 uh, is good enough. And I will keep that and scroll down into the first, uh, the parameter for, for first spatial update. So um, I'm for gonna- point? For point oh one, sorry, for point oh one, I still get the uh, overlapping cells. Uh, overlapping. Uh, I mean, overlapping is fine, right? It's fine. I mean, if the cells are close to each other and overlapping, that's fine. It's yeah. Because you you have two cells that's because it's randomly chosen. Okay. Just choose two cells that's too close to each other. Uh, as long as you know, if you look at some of the more isolated cells, as long as they are kind of reasonable and not, not you know, reaching out really far, uh, it should be fine. Okay, um, I'm gonna print out the parameter of spatial update. Um, uh, again, I think 0.01 is good enough, so I'm not gonna change that. Uh, I do want to mention uh, the other parameter here, so uh, the DL window, 
dilation window is again a parameter purely for computational demands uh, because you know when we're doing spatial update uh, let me go back here you know when we are uh, we we already have an initial guess of the spatial location of cells right and when we do the spatial update we sort of know a cell is is here and here right like they're, I, I, I sort of know their relative position across the field of view. I, when I'm doing spatial update, let's say for, for this corner pixel here, there's no point for me to consider, okay, how much weight I should put on these cells, you know, for this pixel. So, you know, uh, past a certain distance, it, it, it just makes no sense to consider all the cells for every single pixel that will make the update really slow. And that's what the dilation window do. You basically take your initial spatial footprint, uh, do the dilation operation. If you remember from the lecture yesterday, it basically kind of expand uh, your cells by a certain pixel. So in this case, it's gonna expand um, the spatial footprint, uh, the initial sp spatial footprint by five pixel. Expand that, it's gonna say, okay, this is where uh, uh, the maximum a cell can go, like the, the spatial footprint can grow a max five pixels. Uh, if I'm considering a pixel outside of this five pixel, outside of this range, I'm not gonna consider this cell at all. Like, so to save time, like we don't have to kind of calculate a weight for every single cell for every single pixel. And again, it's for computation uh, demand only. You can set that liberally. Like if you, if you want, your spatial footprint to have a potential to grow further, you could go ahead and set it to 10, and not right now, but in your own data. Uh, but usually five is good enough because usually uh, the initial spatial footprint is already quite large enough. So that's dilation window. Sparse penalty we already talked about. Uh, update background, you can almost always leave it to true uh, because this is the only place we are gonna actually update the background. But you know, usually what we find is that it's uh, after this update, the background is gonna be mostly empty. So again, uh, in the pipeline of media, we don't really pay that much attention to background because they are sort of removed already. Um, the last thing I wanna talk about is size threshold. This is a, a post hoc threshold after the spatial update. So after we do spatial update, in some cases, uh, if you have a lot of random noise, you're gonna have really tiny spatial footprint that are not really cells, you know, because because they're not really cells, they're just like one or two pixel that somehow happen to have a a, a calcium activity like uh, thing. So when that happens, uh, it's much easier to just get rid of them uh, here, you know. If you do the spatial update, and somehow you end up with some cell that's like five pixel large or ten pixel large. Uh, which are clearly not real cells, um, you sort of want to get rid of them uh, right here. So that's why we have a, like a post hoc uh, stress holding for the size. Uh, the unit of this parameter is pixel, but it's, it refers to the area of cells. So 25 here means it's, you know, a cell has to be at least 25 pixels large. So uh, that's why we, no, that's why we have a size threshold. But because for today we did the spatial downsampling, uh, if you think about that, 25 pixel is kind of quite large in the original frame space. So I'm gonna go ahead and sort of reduce that and sort of be uh, liberal on this. You know, I can I can be happy with smaller cells that's smaller than 25 pixel. So I'm gonna go ahead and change parameter for spatial size threshold uh, equals, uh, let me see what am I supposed to do, equals to five. Uh, the noun here uh, define the upper limit of the size of a cell. So it rarely happens, but you know, just in case you somehow have crazy large cells, that's not really cells either. You can use this to, to set the upper limit of size. Uh, for some cells. I think uh, one case it can happen is when your recording contains something we call spreading depressions. You know, in hippocampus, sometimes you see um, 
uh, sometimes a, a whole lot of cells kind of all fire together and the whole field of view becomes a blob of light moving in the in your in your video and sometimes cmf can can pick that up as a, as a huge cell but that's not really true so in that case maybe uh you can use this threshold to get rid of that kind of uh, trash uh but for today we're not going to use that so we're going to put a none here which means nothing's going to happen gonna run this make sure uh the parameter is properly updated. Uh, we get to run the following two cell and give it some time. Uh, is there any question about spatial update? Um, I do see the, like what you're describing, like the big blob of calcium moving uh, in the in the video, I do see that sometimes. What did you see? What do you say I could do to change the nine parameters to yeah. to combat that? Uh, I mean, so if if you don't see that, uh, I mean, you see that in a raw video, right? But after yeah, you run, raw video. yeah. But after you run to this stage, uh, if you don't see that in your spatial footprint, there's nothing you need to do, right? That's fine, because like, the algorithm is just ignoring that. Um, but just in case, for some reason, you do see the spatial footprint of some of your cells looks like just like a big blob. That's probably corresponding to, 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 the, to the blob in the raw video. Uh, you can set this to some number. Again, it, this is in pixel area unit. So you can do something like 500 pixels. That basically says uh, the maximum size uh, a cell can have is 500. If it's larger than that, they're going to be discarded. Okay, got it. That's yeah. that's what the so the first number five is the minimum. It's the lower limit. Yes. Number. Okay. It's, it. a it's the upper limit. Yes. yes. Okay. Um, it should be finishing up, at least for me. And then uh, we kind of run the second one, which is kind of like a general visualization of the result. Um, so, you know, you have a, a, like the, the spatial footprint um, before and after. Again, we plotted two versions of them. The left column is the, the real weighted version. Uh, the right column is the binary, binarized version. Uh, so, you know, this is mostly a sanity check uh, to make sure, you know, you still have all your cells here and they don't look anything like weird. Uh, I guess one significant change you can appreciate is that uh, after the update, everyone looks more cell-like because, you know, they, they actually have a gradient and a shape uh, compared to before. Um, you know, everything is kind of flat. Um, so, you know, this is just a sanity check. Uh, as long as you get something similar to this, everything should be fine. And then we go, um, uh, we go ahead and save our sort of temporary result here. Um, the other quick thing I want to mention is that you notice uh, during the CMF part, uh, the real you know update function start to taking more time. And the saving is more more like immediate. Uh, that's sort of by design, just so you know. Um, so if there's no more question about spatial update, I am gonna uh, go ahead and go into temporal update. Um, okay, temporal update, we basically have the same idea. Uh, uh, we have the parameter exploration step. Um, and again, it's we randomly choose 10 units. Uh, we kind of uh, do a for loop to, to explore different parameters. So I'm going to go ahead and run this. And again, uh, just for fun, I'm going to add something to the sparse penalty list to see you know what happens if we go to extreme cases. So if you look at this, uh, we have a sparse list defined right here. 
um, again, I'm going to go ahead and add a zero to that. And you know, the max used to be two, but I'm going to go even crazy. I'm going to add a five to it. And then I'm going to run this. And then I'm going to run the next block to actually display it. <laughs> Okay, so hopefully you get something similar to me. Um, so here we are, you know, in this visualization, we can we only have space to plot stuff for one cell. So this is one cell. Uh, if you want to look at what's going on with the other nine cells you selected, you use this uni ID slide bar, you know, to go through them. Um, you know, to have some sort of general idea of uh, how the algorithm is doing for each cell. Um, so again, uh, because it's randomly selected, you probably won't have uh, something that's identical to me. Uh, but hopefully you can find uh, some example like this, like this guy. So here, you know, the raw trace is, is plotted in red. Uh, the spike signals are plotted in green, you know, so they look like little, little specks here. Um, the fitted calcium trace and signal is sort of they are they are almost always identical to each other. They they are only, the only difference between them is whether there's a slight global uh, shift in baseline and whether you know it's accounting for the initial activity stuff like that. But usually they they are mostly overlapping to each other. As you can see here, they are kind of almost give you a brown trace. Um, so that's the kind of three or four thing plotted here up on top. Uh, here you also have a uh, sort of the modeled uh, calcium event response, just so, so that you can sort of correspond uh, the shape of this with the real raw activity, and to make sure you know the model estimation is doing something correctly. It's not overestimating the decay time or underestimating the decay time, uh, which could happen uh, in, in some cases. So. Uh, well, this is just a spatial footprint of this cell, just for your reference, in case you see like almost completely random noise trace here, uh, you can sort of be more confident that it's trash by looking at spatial footprint. Usually they are just like maybe 10 pixel or something like a random pixel around the edge of the field of view, and they're just completely uh, noise. Um, so that's that. Um, we see that when we basically turn off the sparse penalty, we get something like this. You see clearly this cell, um, you know, it has it has a very clear calcium event right here. But you also have a bunch of you know high frequency noise down here, and the model is kind of putting like it's doing all it can to 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 see calcium events from these random noise. They are trying to find calcium e e event like activity from this noise. And it's gonna try its best to put a spike every time you find something. But apparently the model is seeing wrong things. It's, it's, there are way too many specs here to be real. And that's usually what you tend to see uh, when the sparse penalty is too low, which in this case we know of course is too low. Um, so that's what happens when you set sparse to zero. So, so let's say what it does when we increase this. So you can see that when we get to some point at somewhere at 0.5, uh, the, the green specs mostly disappeared. There may be one or two left. For example, this guy, which you know, if you look at the raw trace, that might actually be real. It's just a small, smaller calcium event. This I'm not gonna. I, I don't know, that may or may not be real. Uh, but other than these two guys, you know, mostly uh, the trace for this cell is clean enough. Um, now let's go, go ahead and see a few other cells. 
I believe here is another example of a cell that's really noisy. I think before it has a bunch of tiny specks. Okay, here we go. You see for this guy, we see the same thing. Uh, when the sparse penalty is low, uh, you have a lot of noisy specks, but when you go to something at 0.5, they are really suppressed. Uh, let's go through a few more cells. That's, you know, that's a clean cell by itself. The signal to noise ratio is already high enough. So it's nothing really uh, needs to be done here. Um, so let's look at what happens if we go crazy uh, on the sparse penalty. Uh, so this is two, which I believe should already cause you a problem, but I'm gonna go even higher with five. I guess somehow this cell survived five, but let's look at the other guys. Uh, well, here is a cell uh, that, you know, clearly there is some sort of calcium event that's missed uh, when we have a sparse penalty that's too high. Here is another guy. Uh, wow, okay, this guy's really, you know, kind of miss a lot. Uh, there's only this uh, initial specs, uh, initial events that's are captured. Uh, all these clear calcium events are sort of being ignored by the model. So again, this is not, it's clearly it's not something you want. You want to avoid this. Uh, and you know, this is how you sort of get a feeling of what's a good value for sparse penalty. So I believe, uh, let's see. I guess in this case, both 0.5 and 0.1, oh, no, definitely not 0.1. Yes, in this case, both 0.5 and 1 is good enough. Uh, maybe I'll go with 1 just to make everything cleaner. Uh, make sure you didn't miss anything when you use 1. So I think everything is pretty well captured. So I'm going to say, OK, 1 is good enough. And, uh, and I'm going to go ahead and do this step and also print out the parameter for temporal update. So, okay, so a uh, parameter for temporal update. We decided that sparse penalty of one is appropriate. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and run the following cells because it's gonna take a while uh, while we talk about this. Um, so noise frequency, again, we have to keep it consistent. It's 0.06 all the way. Sparse penalty, we just visualize that. It's one, it's good enough. Uh, P is the order of autoregressive uh, model, which, you know, it's, um, it's kind of, there's a, there can be some sort of debate about uh, what number to use. So basically P is usually either one or two. Uh, for when p equals to one, it basically means that uh, the CMF model calcium activity as a, a instantaneous rise and a exponential decay. Uh, in other words, the, uh, the calcium activity cannot take time to rise. It has to rise immediately. Uh, on contrary, when p equals to two, uh, the model can, can do something like uh, it can have a certain uh, rise uh, time and a certain decay time. And, you know, in some cases, that's a better model uh, of your real activities. But, you know, for, for at least in our hand, in, you know, CA1 recording, miniscope recording, we usually see something like this, where, you know, the raw activity is already, uh, you know, they are modeled by an instant, instantaneous rise good enough. So we usually keep it to one. And um, that's, you know, uh, why we leave it to one. And, uh, you know, there are argument about which one is better, although P equals to two uh, sounds better because the model is more uh, compli complex. Uh, I think there are, you know, reports saying that when we do this uh, on some dish and we will have the ground truth spiking, somehow P equals to one give you better result, like better correlation with spikes. So there's debate, but, uh, what I want to say here is that, at least in our hand, we usually keep P equals to one, unless we clearly see 
uh, something like a rise time that need to be accounted for by the model. Um, the other two parameters you don't really need to change. Uh, I'm not gonna go into uh, more detail here, you know, for the sake of time, uh, feel free to, to ask questions later or in the breakout room. Uh, I believe it's still running. So uh, yeah, any questions so far? I see a question, perfect. Yeah, I would have a question. Um, so we, would it's, I, I think it's a bit specific. We would like to um, image uh, interneurons. And for these, the calcium transients look very different, at least to the few papers I've seen. Will I run into problems at this stage? Or do you think the autoregressive function will still, is still able to handle this? OK, I probably need expert from TA, because I don't really know how interneuron fire. Uh, do you want to describe or like anyone? Yeah, so uh, the, the firing rate, I mean, so it's it's mainly PV neurons. So, okay, preclaimer, <laughs> we haven't really been so successful yet, so we don't really know either. Um, we have found some papers which claimed that they have done it. Um, mm -hmm. The firing rate is really fast, usually mm -hmm. in these PV interneurons. Mm -hmm. And this means that when you look at the calcium transients, you will see more of a... I mean, like an LFP-like signal, which is fluctuating slowly, but you don't see the clear calcium transients anymore because they will never be really silent in the end. Oh. Uh, I'm the, not really confident. Um, okay, I, I guess I have to really see it or maybe even really run it to know how it does. Uh, I mean, I, mean, I will I, try I anyway. Agree. It sounds problematic. Yeah. Yeah. I could say a couple words. Uh, yeah. I mean, so so it's going to be dependent on the specific case, but right, calcium imaging and in interneurons comes with its own challenges, right? Like a lot of this, these pipelines and just these like deconvolution approaches are kind of designed for these more sparsely spiking types of neurons. Um, but it should be possible. Um, and I think that the biggest concern is that the optimization of these parameters on their own might end up failing. because They're trying to sort of optimize things that aren't as obvious and present in interneuron data. Um, and so you might need a bit more manual intervention to like define these time constants or even potentially, uh, I mean, it, again, it depends exactly on the data, but you might not even need to really go through a deconvolution step um, for some interneuron data. And instead, you might rely on just some uh, like low pass filtering, and deconvolution won't give you much because you sort of have somewhat of a constant calcium signal there, anyways, because you have enough spiking. It should work, but you need to be careful, I guess. Okay, yeah. Okay, thanks. Uh, I see another question. Hi, uh, Phil. Do, do you see any? Do you need to adjust for different um, G comps for like G comp S versus F? Yeah. Uh, actually, okay, that's a good question. That and now you want me explaining this parameter. Um, so let me start by saying this, right? Because I assume you mean do do I need to adjust the waveform for different G comp, right? Basically, this this model the calcium event. Yes. Right. So uh, let me start by saying this is now you something. Uh, Daniel will disagree because he like to manually do stuff. But at least in my uh, at least in Minian, um, this is kind of uh, estimated automatically for you. Uh, you know, it, you know the model is auto regressive model. There are one or two parameters in that, and you know the the function will basically estimate those parameters for you. You know, that's kind of like a like a decay constant, something like that, uh, based on your raw traces here. Um, so you don't need you 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 can't really adjust that sort of manually at least right now. Uh, of this, Daniel will if you want Daniel will, will tell you how to hack it, but at least right now you can't really adjust that. Uh, the only thing I want to mention is that um, 
because the, the model uh, is automatically estimating for you, I leave a parameter here called additional lag. Uh, I'm not going to explain why it's called like that, but basically it tells you how much uh, data you, you should use or how many time stamps, uh, time steps you should use when estimating the parameter. So uh, usually you can leave it this uh, relatively large. Uh, the idea is that uh, the model will estimate uh, the waveform parameter for you based on the, the auto covariance of the raw signal. And this tell you, you know, how much this parameter tell you how much steps of auto covariance you should use for this. And the only thing I, I think you want to make sure is that this number like 100 means 100 times step of frames. You want to make sure this number is kind of large enough for your calcium decay. Like it kind of capture a typical calcium event so that when the model is trying to estimate the parameter for you, it, it use a proper amount of data for the estimation. So that's the only thing I can think of that you might need to adjust for different calcium uh, like GCAM indicator. Uh, but other than that, you know, make sure to check this to make sure that the time decay of this match up the raw trace uh, of what you see with your calcium indicator. As long as this match up, it sh everything should be fine. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Oh, not too long, that took five minutes. I hope it also finished for everyone. And if that's the case, let's I, um, visualize everything. Uh, the plotting library doesn't really like what I'm doing, but you can feel free to ignore these warnings. Um, so yeah, here is again, a, a more, more like a sanity check visualization where we're just plotting the uh, the temporal like calcium activities before and after the update and the deconvolved spec signal. Uh, we didn't really generate any initial spec signal, so that's why it's empty here. Um, so again, this is more like a sanity check. You want to make sure you see you know, calcium-like activity in here. Uh, you see the specs are relatively sparse. Uh, one thing that, I, that you can potentially see is something like a yellow line here in the spec which means a cell is sort of constantly firing. Um, so if you sort of see that, <clears throat> that's usually a good indication of uh, the sparse penalty not being choose correctly. You're probably having a too low a sparse penalty, so some cell can go crazy. Or maybe it's just one or two cells uh, that are just, you know, they are, they are, it's something weird about them. Uh, you might want to go back and look at what happened with them. Uh, but anyway, this is more like a sanity check uh, plot. Uh, because, you know, there is a chance you're going to drop cells uh, in temporal update. So we do have a visualization of the dropped cells. So here's how it looks like. Uh, allow me to scroll up a little bit. Um, the, in the temporal update, it does print out uh, how many cells were dropped. In this case, we only have one dropped out of the six, like 700 cells we have. So. This is a guy that's been dropped. Uh, it is, uh, and so we, we have the spatial footprint of this guy. We have the spatial footprint of all the accepted cells. Uh, you know, you can go in and look at, okay, what's going on with this? Okay, it's kind of small, I don't really know. Uh, but the temporal activity, I guess the only thing is that it, it sort of have an initial like decay. Like it's, it's almost like, in the beginning of recording, the cell is kind of firing and it's already kind of decaying. But for the rest of session, uh, it's just purely noise. Uh, so that's why this mod the model doesn't really like this guy. I decided to drop it. Uh, so in this case, I, I guess I'm happy with dropping this guy. Like if it's not really firing during my recording, I don't really care what it does. Uh, so, but you know, in other cases, if you see real calcium activity here in the middle of session, uh, you should go back and, and, and think, okay, what happened? Why is it being dropped? It's almost, uh, it's probably a sparse penalty issue. Um, but in, the case, in any case, this is the visualization for drop unit. Uh, if there's no one dropped, it's just gonna print out a message saying everything's fine, no one's being dropped. So 
If you're happy with result, let's go ahead and do the save. And then let us quickly do section 6.4 and uh, do, a, uh, do a quick merge. Let me just go ahead and run this for one, two, three, four. Uh, up to here, 6.5. And then I'm ready for question. I see two questions at least. Okay, I might go, I think Anna's hand just kind of stayed up. Yeah. Uh, okay. Correct me if I'm wrong though, of course. Um, yeah, actually I was wondering in terms of uh, reproducibility, um, cause now, I mean, like there were some kernel restarts and whatnot, but, uh, given that I'm, you know, we're using the same parameters and stuff. And for example, here in this case, uh, I didn't drop any units, right? Um, oh, that's interesting. Yeah. I mean, okay. uh, again, it's, it's, but it's, I guess that's the question. Like maybe I messed something up right before I didn't change a parameter I was supposed to change. Yeah. Uh, but otherwise it should give you the same result or do you actually have to initialize the seed of some random number generator at the beginning or something like that to make it fully reproducible, right? Um, well, for the C spec, uh, the, for the C step, we did use a deterministic strategy, right? We define a window size and we, we basically go the rolling window. So if we're using that, there's really no randomness uh, gotcha. in this process, I say. Uh, I do remember, uh, oh, okay, first of all, our result at least similar enough. I guess I have 693 cells. Uh, do you have a similar number? Uh, one second, let me scroll up. Um, I just saw I didn't drop any because I got that message, right? Uh, but let okay. me see the printout. I got 584. Again, oh. if you if you tell me it should be, um, what do I call it, deterministic, maybe I messed something up. Um, yeah, I think, the, uh, you know, above. When preparing for this, I I'm pretty sure I run this multiple times, and you know I, you know I, I sort of prepare for this part because mm -hmm. I know there's gonna be a guy that's being dropped. So, uh, gotcha. No, no, but that, that then, then that's yeah. totally fine. I, I yeah. actually didn't know because you know I've, I've never looked into the innards of the thing if there's any step yeah. that's actually stochastic, but yeah. it's not super nice to know that then yeah I can again I probably messed it up. Uh, but the, but that normally it would just run and yeah exactly be deterministic and stuff because you know when one yeah. you know if I publish a paper then I publish the code and the data and then people's like you know you want to rerun it and yeah get the same thing awesome yeah. thanks man I understand yeah uh, I I'm I can tell you out of my hand uh, out of my head I couldn't think of any uh, randomness in this process um, I'm maybe ninety percent sure but you know I don't want to say something really stupid <laughs> I find out I'm wrong later. But yeah, right now I would say I would expect it to be deterministic. Well, one possible difference between everyone is the way that we create the ROI for subsetting for motion correction. So it's possible maybe that small differences there. Uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, but nice. from 600 to five, like you're yeah. missing uh, 100 cells, that sounds like something significantly different. Before the temporal merge, I have 700 something cells, and after the merge, I have 500 cells. Uh, sorry, which merge are you referring to? The temporal merge. Uh, is it the one I'm showing right now, or the one in initialization? Uh, the six four. The number six four four, like this, right? Yeah, yeah. So if I look at the uh, blue thingy here, the temporal signals before merge and temporal signals after merge, then I have 700 something versus 500. Yeah, so basically what I'm getting right here, right? Yeah, a few less on the temporal signals after merge. Oh, oh really? Cool. Like maybe, yeah, maybe four, maybe even 50 less. Oh, but wow. I have more on the left side. I have more than 700 on the left side. Okay, let's see what's going on. Uh, let's print out. So I guess if you read, oops. So if you read the code, it says, uh, 
run unit merge on ANC and the output will be ANC merge. Uh, I'm pretty sure that will be consistent. So if you print out A, and let me print out A merge. Oh, ah, damn it, I already saved it. I run this too early. Uh, Okay, I guess I only have the, the data afterwards then. Uh, I get 552 after the merge. That's, I'm not sure whether that's consistent across everyone. I don't know, do, do, do anyone get drastically different number? Mine's in the 400s. Oh, really? Oh, Mine is totally roughly the same. Anyone. Sorry. Sorry, let's go ahead. I don't know what's... Okay, I don't know. Anyway, um, does anyone have more questions? Uh... Hi there, Phil. So I noticed that in the old versions, actually, the add lag was at 20. Uh, you know, sorry, in old, old version what? So the, the add lag uh, parameter. Uh huh. So in the old version, it was set at 20, and actually, there is. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I sort of increased that because I, I realized um, it's probably more appropriate for this data set. Um, yeah. Okay, so, but because I'm actually using a different type of GCAMP because I mean, the, the place where I was actually used another one. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, where should I look inside the, those results to see, I mean, which number is more appropriate in case my signal is as lower? Uh, in, in case your signal is lower or? Um, yes. Well, I would say it's more about how the, the, so that number only affect how this model looks like. So I would say uh, it's not really about the amplitude of signal, it's more about uh, whether the, the time course of this modeled uh, decay match up with your raw traces. Okay, so I should look at my raw traces and then yeah. check if the model below actually is correct or not. Exactly, yes. And based on that, uh, I should change my my lag parameter to... Yeah, I think so, like uh, increase it like, or like make sure it kind of cover a typical calcium event um, so that okay. the model will be correct. Okay, so like for example, here is from zero to 400. And yeah. Why lobster is like, uh, what is that? I mean, 5,400? Yeah. So it's basically like this. So to. So four, five, four, zero, zero to five, eight, zero, zero. So it's 800. So your model is actually halving at the real time? Uh, wait, it's the same, right? Am I seeing it different? So this is four from four hundred. No, no, you're right. It's the same. So it's four hundred yeah. minutes. Okay. Yeah. So in case of, for example, you put twenty, what would happen? So basically, what twenty does is that you know it only. So because the the way it estimates, I take this right trace, right? I kind of shift yeah. that to calculate all the auto covariance. If you say twenty, it basically only gonna use twenty time stamps for the shift. I use those auto covariance to, to calculate uh, the model, the parameter for the model. I, I guess in this case, you know, from from five four four thousand to twenty, that's kind of it only covers signals like in this range, and you know sometimes that might be might not be enough to estimate the correct parameter for the model. Okay, so. So your curve will actually not follow the real signal. It will probably cut it or something. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Cool. No, yeah. It yeah. might be already long or already short or something weird. <clears throat> so, but so that number will actually be dependent on your frequency rate if you are done sampling in time. Yes. Or... Exactly. Yeah. Okay. And 
what happens if one changes changes the p from one to two? Oh, the <clears throat> when you have p equals to two, this model will uh do I have time? Uh I kind of want to show you. Um but to describe it to you, this model will basically have a, a more uh you know rise time. Uh, mm -hmm. because it has an additional degree of freedom. It's because mm -hmm. P equals to one basically say that you have to kind of immediately rise and then you just decay. There's basically only one parameter that's being estimated, that is the decay constant, sort of. But uh when P equals to two, you have kind of two parameters. It can take some time to rise and then take more time to decay. Cool. So in some sense, your model will be slightly more complex. And in some cases, it will be better. It will be a better model of a real signal. Nice. So, but yeah. in that case, do I have to change the, the lag parameter? So the lag parameter is counting the frames from, from the rise, correct? Yeah. So it will not change. It will count uh, the things in the same way. Yeah, kind of the same, almost the same way. Yeah. Okay, cool. So if I change one parameter, I don't have to change the other one to. No, okay. not usually. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to quickly go through the one parameter in the merge step uh, that's just threats of correlation. Uh, if you remember, we we did a merge of seeds before, and there we have uh, have much more. Uh, I guess we have two more parameters, which is the spatial distance and the noise frequency. Uh, the reason we don't do anything of that is, you know, we are at this stage dealing with quite clean signals. Like we're dealing with the uh, the calcium activity like this that's being estimated from the model. So. The first thing is that we don't really need to denoise it anymore because it's free of noise. Um, so that's why we don't care about noise frequency anymore. Uh, the other reason is that, uh, so uh, because we our spatial footprint are, uh, are in a much better state, they are you know estimated by the model. Um, we are not gonna threshold the distance uh, at all because you know every single cell that have at least one pixel in overlap we're gonna consider them as a potential target for merge because you know, after this stage, they, the spatial footprint should already be sort of well-defined. If, uh, if two cells are really separate from each other, they will not have any overlap. So that's why we don't you know, threshold distance anymore. And that's why the only parameter in here is a threshold for the correlation of two cells to be merged. Uh, you know, then this step is quite straightforward. You just take all the cells any pair of cells who have any overlap in the spatial footprint will be computed, you know, will compute a, a correlation of that. And then if it pass 0.8, they're going to be merged. And, you know, usually you get something like this. You go from something like 700 cells to 500 cells. Uh, it, the, the exact number of cells, of course, depends on the, the real data you're working with. And again, this is just a sanity check uh, of, you know, uh, how much cell you, you sort of expect to get by eye and see whether they are uh, being properly merged. Um, so that's the only thing I'm going to say about merging. And then after that, we are going to go into a second iteration of CMF, the spatial and temporal update. And I think, you know, because it's me talking a lot uh, already, um, we are going to do a breakout room right here. And the goal, like you have, now you have a little task in a breakout room. The goal is for you to run through the second iteration uh, of CMF, basically the sp second spatial update and the second uh, temporal update uh, by yourself. So all the way you run, run through all this, you, you know, look at the parameters, maybe add in a few more if you want to get a feeling of uh, what the range of numbers is doing. Uh, change the parameter if you see a better fit. And then uh, by the time we, resu we resume, let's make sure we run to this uh, visualization line uh, that says generate videos, where you know we're doing a, a final visualization of the result. And I want to show you know what do you do to do a final kind of check uh, of the result you get. 
uh, let's actually make sure to run this line because that's also going to take a while. So make sure you run the generate video lines and we'll resume here.